Uh, last session, we ended up chatting a bit about some of the things you can do to raise your profile. Um, you know, we all acknowledge that we're all introverts at the end of the day. So some of those things aren't as easy as other things are. But, um, you know, I, I thought it'd be a good place in time. And I don't know if folks want to turn their cameras on. It, it helps a lot if you do to not be looking at black boxes that have a name on them. Thank you, Christian. Um, it, I, when I get, I was telling, when I give my lectures, I lecture to 103 black boxes on most days. <laughs> it's really frustrating. It's one, of, it's one of the really difficult things. So now we're back in person this year and I'm so excited. But um, anyway, I'm happy, you know, to to talk about things. I thought we could just have a, have a shared conversation here. Chris, you might want to say a few things and, you know, we can talk about this, this sometimes difficult topic for folks. Um, yeah, of course, Cindy. Uh, I am Chris. I'm a dentist scientist, and I am a mentee. I participated. I participated of the third cohort of the Mind the Future program. And in a moment of my career, that I was a trend. I had. I had a K O one funded. I was super happy for this K O one, but at the same time, I was doing the transition in my own in the same department, with the same boss. And that was awesome at one side because it's a place that I love to work. But at the other hand, how to rebrand the crease that was a, that started as a volunteer and that became a postdoc. And now it's a research assistant professor fighting for a tenure track offer in the same uh, department because I couldn't, I chose not to move from OHSU because my family established there. I have two kids that are in high school and the best way to have your kids never talk to you again, it's to move them from school when they are in high school with their boyfriends, girlfriends and everything. So I, and besides that, I had a very tortuous career path. I'm a dentist scientist. And then I, I, I graduated, I had a, a PhD in neuropathology, experience in hospital with oral cancer. Then I moved here to Portland because of family uh, choices. I started doing tissue engineering and organs on a chip. And then I moved, but how can, and then the moment that I got the K1, my lab moved to the Cancer Institute. So I had to rebrand myself and reinvent myself several times and I didn't know what to do. I was very lost at this point. And when Cindy was a match as my mentor to the Mind the Future program, we had our first discussion and I was talking to her about my choices, my career choices, so she could know me better. And at the end of, the, at the end of the, 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 our meeting, she just said, well, we have to craft a scientific identity for you. It was so, it, it, if a, a, a light had struck me at that moment, it wouldn't have made that effect. I said, yeah, I don't have a scientific identity here. I had it in Brazil. I was Chris in Brazil. Everybody knew me because of, X, Y, and Z characteristics and science, but here I don't. And this is what we worked in the Mind the Future program. And that resulted in a, our one submission that was exactly, that had my voice there. And um, yeah, so this is the journey that we had that Cindy helped me. And now we want to share this because the moment that I talked to my peers about how my, my mentor of the mind the future, Cindy was helping me to craft my scientific identity. People would stare and say, well, I never thought about that. And I say, wow, this problem is more common than I thought. And we thought it was very valuable to open this room for conversation because we don't know who we can talk to because sometimes our mentors not, are not the best person to help us to craft our scientific identity. And it's not because they don't want to, it's because sometimes you have a mentor, you have a coach, and have a sponsor. And yeah, so feel free to, to give your input to ask. Now I give it back to you, Cindy. Yeah, anyway, and I'd love to ask, you know, answer any questions or have anybody bring up any, any things that motivated them to come to this room. Um, but, you know, I mean, as, as, as I always say, I mean, the, the reason that I'm still here and in this place is because I'm very persistent 
And I think that's part of my identity. You know, I, I will tell you, you know, that I love extracellular matrix. It's been one of the, the themes of, of my life. I've worked on many different aspects of that over my career. Um, but I've, I've always woven that in and everybody that knows me knows that I, you know, love ECM and anything, whether that's related to tissue engineering, which I do a lot of now, or, you know, now I've gotten interested in fibrosis because we're looking at radiation things. I mean, but, but, you know, ECM is, is kind of, kind of my thing. And, um, what we talk about too, is, you know, how do you, um, I, I know going to study section, getting a job, um, getting promoted. These are all the really key things that happen when you're an early stage investigator. And as much of that is about your science and, and the quality of your work and your ideas as it is about you and people thinking you are the right person for this. You're the right person to join their faculty. You're the right person to have that funding. You're the right person to give that talk at that meeting. And how do they know that, right? And 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 that just comes, you know, from from building and crafting an idea, uh, an identity that's built on your on your ideas and things that you love over time. And um, you know, I, I can't stress enough the the value of of doing that. It should be in your NIH bio sketch, you know, where you have your paragraph to tell people who you are and why you're the the person to be doing that work. But it should also be in a public bio sketch. If you don't have one, you should make one that you send every time you give a talk and it says, hi, I'm Cindy and this is who I am. This is my interest. And it should be more than just about your science. I mean, your science is definitely part of it. Um, your clinical interests, whatever, you know, motivates you, but also let them know who you are. You know, what are your passions? What do you care about? What makes you um, excited um, when when you come into work in the morning and um, and and all of that it, you know it really needs to be crafted and you know for those of you that are like Chris staying in the same environment you need to make sure that you develop an identity that's separate from your previous mentors right you have to you have to carve out your own um, identity and it's it's not so easy there's lots of of things we could talk about as as ways to do that. Um, you know, networking and and doing things, taking advantage of opportunities, being some front and center ones, um, so that you're not just a, a name on a CV when people review your grants or hear you talk. But um, anyway, let me stop there and see if anybody has any any questions or things you would like to talk about. I have a question. Certainly, I'm Christian Hearn. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Buffalo. In shaping your research ID, what would you say the balance is between focusing on your research, your progress in your research, and the foci of your research compared to those extracurricular things that you do, um, helping out review papers on study sections, helping with the department? What is that balance with those between your research and extracurriculars? So, I mean, you know, most people don't. Uh, for, for those of us I think are in this audience, most of us are being hired for our um, research and scholarship, right? So, so that has to be front and center, right? But what you want to weave through it, right? Not, not replace it, not be an addendum to it, but weave through it is your other interest in other things. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Um, so, you know, I spent most of my career as, as some folks know, working on bone and cartilage, which is what Dr. Brown worked on, right? And at the time she knew me, I didn't do anything or was just getting started with salivary gland work. I didn't do anything in that area. I spent my career in bone. And then for crazy reasons, I got involved in, in salivary research, okay? So how do I tell that story to people that I'm gonna ask for funding? They're gonna say, why should we fund you to do salivary research? You're a bone and cartilage researcher, right? So I have to weave my story through that so that that my identity tells tells that tale. OK, so, um, you know, I tell a story about my sabbatical and how, you know, I, I uh, met someone who, you know, was a desperate patient who said, I know, you know, that 
you do bone and cartilage research, but I don't have any spit and it's making me miserable. And can you help me? You know, that's essentially um, what happened. And so I weave that with my story of how my favorite extracellular matrix molecule Perlican we used for both bone and cartilage engineering, but also for salivary engineering. So I weave my science with my tale of a patient who brought a problem to our attention, right? Who, which had never really been on my radar. And so you you make yourself distinctly human by by you know, telling people how, I mean, what are you passionate about? Uh, bacterial adhesins and interacting with the host. Okay. How did you become passionate about that? Uh, general microbiology. And then my PhD thesis was about adhesins and pathogenic bacteria using those adhesins to infect the host. Okay. So why did that fascinate you? I'm sure in your life you've been exposed to 40,000 things and you, that one stuck with, literally stuck with you, right? So Right. Right. Literally. I had to, I had to do the pun. I couldn't help it. Very nice. I'll have to use that when I'm creating my narrative that it's stuck with me. <laughs> um, yeah. I just thought it was interesting. I thought they were like little machines grabbing onto things. I know that's humanizing them and you shouldn't do that for your research, but I thought it fascinating that they are sticking to things like Velcro or glue. So work that in, you know, and, and if you wanted to work that in with the fact that, you know, you're a persistent person, you know, and so you tend to stick with things too. I mean, come up with a clever way to tell your story that integrates you as a human being with your science, with your passions, and yet also shows a deep understanding of what, what you're doing, right. And what you care about and what questions you want to ask. So, you know, People like that, right? I when I read a grant, I mean, I can't tell you how many I can't, I've reviewed thousands of grants, I feel like at this time in my life. And I love it when they make it a little bit interesting, right? When they when they tell me a story or started out, you know, not just the statistics on how many people have this. I mean, I can look that up, but when they tell me a story in a grant, you know, it has a um and and I love it too when I look at their biosketch and I see in their biosketch, I know you don't have too much room, but if it's well crafted, I can understand why that problem fascinates you and why you want to work on that and what problem you want to solve and how you want to, you know, help people who suffer from these problems. And that's your that's your place. And all that will improve, you know, your identity. And when you give talks, weave that in there too. I mean, think about talks you've heard in your life. Aren't the ones you remember the ones where they the speaker humanized themselves and you don't just have, you could have just read the paper, but they told you a story, right? So weave all that together into, into one identity, if that makes, you know, and, and over time, as you tell that story enough, people will associate you with it, right? And you'll be the person that they want to talk about that. They'll be the person if that's, they need that person on their team. That's who they want to hire. If somebody needs that expertise on their grant, you're who they want to collaborate with because you have that identity. Great. Thank you. And if you want to organ on a chip, ask Chris. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Anybody That's else? True. And I'm going to tell you this story. And I think I never told you this story about me starting with organs on a chip because I moved to Portland because of my husband and Christian this is for you as well to say that when we humanize things and then I I entered into this lab that gave me the opportunity to to be a volunteer there and I, I'd never heard about tissue engineering never I, I didn't know what was a hydrogel and <laughs> I didn't know how to open the the flask of super glue because it was too fancy and I didn't have that in Brazil. So I was I I felt that I was a monkey in the lab. I didn't know what to do. And then I said, okay, but I have to be here. I have to to have be funded somehow. What I can, what's something that no one wants to do, but I can do. What's my niche? And then I said, well, Louise has this grant funded to develop this tooth on a chip. It's very hard. People don't want to do it. And I'm a dentist. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to get a grant on this because in the future, I can combine the platform to, to as a pathologist to make diseases on a chip. 
and it, it was crazy. It was a, a, a ride, a roller coaster, but it worked. And I got fascinated. Now I, I have the opportunity to work and develop organs on a chip, and I love them. Really, really do. It's a window to, to what's happening to the body, but it's how I'm going to buy the milk for my kids with organs on a chip. Okay, so let's do it. <laughs> That's right. Great. Thank you. You bet. Rose, what things do you think about? Me? Yeah. Yes, I, I love it. Uh <laughs> Uh, Chris, you know, whenever you see that window, I um, I remember the first time when I heard you say that, I was so impressed. I said, wow, a window to look at how things work. Sounds fantastic, right? I mean, we I also work on oral cancer. Um, so when, Cindy, you mentioned about the um, scientific identity, I, I guess that's a very, I think it's very important. Because uh, I'm in a similar boat with uh, Chris. I kind of, well, similarly, because I came from a different field. I didn't go to a dental school. So I came from a, a biophysics, bioengineering background. So I entered uh, to this field like uh, five, six years ago, just because of the op opportunity, you know, um, to develop something related to cancer early detection. And because I did some cancer research in my in my PhD, so I started, you know, it fascinated me. So I started working on that. Also, I thought I can use my biophysics, bioengineering background to uh, to propel that direction, you know. So it's not um biology-based approach, it's very much like a bioengineering, biophysics-based approach for early oral cancer detection. So talk about um, identity, right? And um, I'm in a similar boat because I also, I started from uh, my mentor's lab. Now I'm trying to also differentiate myself. I mean, we work together happily for many years. It's a, it, it has been a great experience for me. But um, since I joined this Mind Future program, I, I realized that I need I need my own identity, right? Like mm -hmm. I need my own, hopefully maybe separate publication, something like that, you know? Because in the past, uh, you know, we published together. Uh, just because we work together, it's like very natural. So how, you know, Chris or, or maybe Cindy, so what's, what's your advice, you know, for somebody who continue to work with her or his mentor and, I mean, working very well together, how do we differentiate? Maybe I, I missed the information in the first session, but I like to ask this question because it's uh, related to my current situation like uh, to establish my own identity, although you publish together, how, how do we do that? You know? I want to let Chris take this one because this has been a very frequent conversation that we have had over the last year. Yeah, it's a rose. There is no one size fits all. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing with uh, Louise. And it, it has been working so far. We. We have strategically uh, planned the milestones for my growth. And I, I was always very uh, sincere to him, very clear and, and candid to him about my goals. And it is a win-win. If I want to progress, he needs, I, I need to give him something to progress as well. So it's a two-way road. He helps me and I help him. And so we strategize the, the grants, we strategize the, my, my knowledge, my scientific growth. And now that I'm, I, we've published these big papers together about vasculature, I said, I cannot work with, uh, only with endothelial, uh, vascular blood endothelial cells. We decided that now in the Cancer Institute, I am going to develop to, to pivot a little bit to lymphatic, vasculature and work with the with um, invasion vascular invasion lymphatic invasion of cancer for this first grant and I'm going to be working more with the extracellular matrix immunomodulatory we in, in our 101 conversations we we crafted a plan so I, we can I, we can work in synergy and mm -hmm. complement each other so we can grow together. Mm -hmm. 
but I needed to be proactive, proactive in the sense that I showed him my ideas. He wouldn't give him, he wouldn't give me his ideas, even though he knew, he had in his mind what was best. He waited for me to be proactive and say, I want to work with macrophages, with immune modulation, and I want to work with lymphatic vasculature because that complements your work. And we can have uh, publications in collaboration. We can have our labs working together, our students working together, but we will not compete for the same space, for the same grants. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of strategy and human relationships, being fair to the person that's helping you as well. Yeah. This is how we approached it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and just as we spoke about a little bit, if you can find some part of that that is uniquely yours, right? Mm -hmm. That is not part of the collaboration, some different angle, some different thing, maybe some, you know, biophysical modeling uh, or something like that that is different and will be associated with you on every paper. Even if it's collaborative, that's the role you played and everybody knows it, right? Because mm -hmm. because they know that that's what you do. Um, and, you know, then, of course, you need to be senior author on things, not in the middle, you know, if you're the if you're running the show, because people will look for that at this time of transition where you become senior author. Um, I was very fortunate um, that Bill Butler, who was, you know, my um, advisor, but all, he was my mentor, but he was also my chair and everything. And he agreed to go as the middle author on several of those papers that, and so that I could be senior author. Because as long as I was first author and he was senior author, everybody just thought that it was his work and I was working in his lab, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah, but that he, happened yeah, to me because um, for most of the paper we published together, I was the first author because I did the actual work. You know? Yes. Then my mentor, of course, you know, was a senior author. So, so that, so you think, um, going forward, in order to have my own identity, I should be position myself more on the senior authorship, right? Yes. yes, yes, at least for some of those papers, absolutely, because that that says you're the one that's driving the story, right? Not the one that's conducting the story, but the one that's driving and leading the story. Yeah. So you need to you need to have those conversations about authorship too. Okay, that's very yeah, that's wonderful advice. In terms of the unique contribution, uh, I I'm happy I do have that you know aspect. Uh, like Chris, you know, I think for all the work we do, I bring the unique skill of machine learning. Like <laughs> there you, you know, go. That's yep. kind of my unique. You know, if they say uh, you know there is a machine learning, they know I am involved in developing that. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. And, and if that's part of your identity, you know, you're the, like for me, it's extracellular matrix. For you, it's machine learning. That should be the very first sentences in your top of your NIH biosketch, mm. right? I bring my passion for machine learning to these problems, right? It's right. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for sharing your <laughs> experience and Cindy, for sharing your uh, wonderful advice. Yeah, That's it's really helpful. important. It's mm -hmm. really important as we make the, and you know, and eventually you'll have trainees who are doing most of the work under your supervision, yeah. right? right? And then they'll yeah. need to be first author. Right, right. Yeah, I do have my students, PhD. Yeah. Right. So they'll need to be first authors, you know, for their work and you then become senior. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. You bet. Anybody else have a question or a story or a problem? Or... Now it's the time. We're more quiet in this session than the first one. Yeah. You know, the, the other the other thing I will, you know, if, if nobody wants to weigh in, the other thing that I'll talk about that came out of our last um, was it was an issue in the last um, uh, session we had is about negotiating. Um, because, you know, while it's, it's not exactly part of this topic, it's completely integrated into this topic. And um, I think that being able to um, 
leverage your identity into negotiating a position that will let you um, have time to pursue those key components of your identity is critical. Um, and so, you know, if, 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 for example, you're somebody that wants to be a, a clinician scientist and have room to see patients, but also to do your research and serve on some service and do different things like that, it's critically important that you negotiate that time. Because, you know, like in, in my role as associate dean, I very often have to go and talk to the chairs of our clinical departments um, to make sure that the, the faculty have um, enough release time from the clinic to work on their scholarship so they can be promoted. And it, it really, you know, we never have enough people to cover the clinics ever. And so it can become a real problem, especially for the clinical faculty. Um, but some of them have R01, they have R03s or they have K awards and they need time to spend on that research and you can't get it done if you're always in the clinic. And so, um, you know, that that's another really important um, aspect of, of, of that because, you know, it, it's, it's powerful to be um, a clinician scientist. We don't have enough of them as you hear, you know, routinely from the NIDCR, we would love to have many more because there's a unique ability to see a problem all the way from the basic side, all the way to the healthcare and delivery of those discoveries. But it's hard to be all those things, right? So how do you succeed in those roles? Um, and you need a lot of coaching and a lot of mentoring to, to make sure that you have time um, for all those things. Um, I spent yesterday with one of our clinical faculty who's ready to quit and go to private practice. And, you know, he's somebody that the NIH has invested heavily in his career, but he's just so frustrated because he's not having time to do it all. So, um, you know, talking him off that cliff was part of my yesterday. So I'm, I'm, yeah, but it's really true. I mean, there's just a constant pull in every direction. So you need to feel really strong and comfortable in your own identity to fight for it, right? You have to fight for it. You have to say no sometimes. You have to say, you know, yeah, I know you don't have enough people to, to cover that clinic, but, and I can do it maybe once a month, I can be on emergency, but nope, Thursdays are my day for research or, you know, and you got to stick to it because um, they'll ask you to, they'll ask you to do it. And I think the same thing is true for a lot of faculty in research who get asked to do an awful lot of teaching or service, um, you know, and in my experience, that that can really be, you know, um, I've heard every argument there is about why um, the young people do the best teaching and service because they're most in touch. They've got, you know, the the most time, the best ideas, and all of that. Um, but you know, when you're when you're building your own identity and building your own career, you need to be focusing on those key parts of your activities that will build that, not things that help other other people. Um, I think one of the things I said in the last meeting is, you know, yes, you have to do things that we talked about networking. Chris might want to talk a little bit about the importance of networking. But um, when you when you network and when you do these things, choose strategically how to network, you know, and how to do this. And don't don't give up all your time to to service commitments that will not give back to your career. It's it's really, you know, I had to get one of my mentees that Chris knows off of the curriculum committee because it was taking up all her time and she wasn't getting her grant written, right? So um, it's just it's just things like that. But really, you got to fight. You got to fight not only for your identity, but you got to fight for the time to preserve it. So um, anyway. Yeah, and uh, talking about time, there was one one time in one of our 101 meetings, you told me that you owned your own time. I you still do. Allow... <laughs> yes. I wanted to share this with uh, them because when we are postdocs, early faculty, we are pulled in so many directions and, we th mm -hmm. and everything is good for our career development. Participate in this committee, review this paper, and, and everything is service. And, and we, are, we have our K grants that and it's crazy because everything is good and we feel pressure to, to accomplish even more and more, to establish our identity. But 
how can we feed all these things into time without burning out? Exactly. It's difficult. It's really difficult. But crafting the identity also means to say no to some things. Because we know exactly who we are, who we want to be, how we want to be uh, positioned in the, within the players. So it's saying yes to some things and no to others. Yeah. I had ADOC one of our, go uh, ahead, go ahead. Keep yeah, going. ADOCR is a very good place to network. Networking is really important for many things in life. And that's interesting because uh, we, we underestimate, we researchers, we underestimate the power of networking, but networking properly with, as human beings, with other human beings. And ADOCR is a wonderful place. Volunteering at ADOCR helps people know us for what the service we do, the quality of service in science that we deliver. And that is part of crafting our identities, networking at the right places. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I think that that really comes into like strategic, you know, it, time is the precious, most precious commodity, right? So how do you spend that? And you know, yes, it's really important to network. I mean, you know, um, and to know to know the right people so that you're not just a, a name on a list, right? But how do you do that um, becomes, you know, more difficult. And, you know, I go to meetings and I go to things and I've done this for many, many decades now um, is always try to meet somebody new, right? Always just try to meet somebody new. Um, walk in a room and whenever I, you know, I'm, I'm, People don't believe it, but I really am very much introverted. And, you know, it's it, you get awkward when you go into a room full of people you don't know or or things like that. And even to this day, and I have just trained myself, introduce yourself to somebody and say hello. And I, I'm not the person that's going to make the rounds of the entire room. But over time, if you meet somebody in every room you go to, over time, you know a lot of people, right? And you know, other folks to try to get to meet are folks that serve on study sections that you might be submitting grants to if you can meet and network with them because they can see you and they see your face and they see your energy and they see your ideas. And, you know, then when they see your grant, you're not just a, 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 a name on a file anymore. You're a person with a face and a voice and all those things that they, and people do remember you, you know, I remember all these folks that I meet. So um, you know, take advantage of that. So, what else is on your mind, Christian? Anything else, or no? I think you addressed uh, my main question about the identity, and also help clarify what it means to have an identity and what aspects go into that. So, I think I'm good for now. What are you planning to do next? What What is your next challenge? Yeah. So, uh, my more immediate challenge is writing my RO3, but eventually I want to become a PI. So I'm that pre-transition stage in my career. Are you getting people to read your grants, read everything? I mean, how are you going about that? Yeah. So right now it's more drafting the ideas for the collaborator and making sure that my ideas are different enough for my PI that help not only complement my skill set and what the training that I have from my current PI, but also individualizing myself and making sure I'm not just doing something parallel to my PI. So right mm -hmm. now that is working with collaborators. And then as you had suggested, getting outside readers uh, right now, just in my department about does this, in does the idea interest you and does it sound unique and different from my PI or does it sound like some of the same? Do you use the NIH reporter? I, I've been talking, do you use the NIH reporter? Uh, yes. So kind of tracking what things are being funded or what topics are being funded. Uh, I'm, I might not be using it to its full capacity, but I do track essentially what's getting funded or try and follow yeah. some trends. It's a great way to know what's getting funded in your area, you know, right? and, and to make sure that your ideas are distinct from what's already been funded, right? Absolutely. Right. Anybody else have any questions, thoughts, stories to share? Well, there is one thing, Cindy, that I learned the hard way is that do not wait to write your uh, scientific identity or the paragraph that describes you when people ask you for a bio. Oh, yeah. Write it in a moment where you, you, you know, that one hour that 
when experiment ended earlier, a meeting was canceled, is just to write in, and to leave it ready because I had to write it as people asked me about my bios and the first versions were not exactly the message that I wanted to convey. Exactly, right? It's not so trivial, like you just put it together, right? No, and, it's and, not. It takes a lot of thought. You know, and for different funding mechanisms, you know, I have several different versions of that that I use. Like there's one I use for pure science grants, you know, pure basic science grants, which are more, you know, more focused on, on my favorite research topics and how I'm interested and so forth. But there's also another one that I use for training grants and things like that, mm -hmm. that focuses more on my mentees and mm -hmm. all the things that they've done and that they've accomplished, you know, so have a, and, you know, cause, and they're, they're all part of me, but you don't have enough room to write about all of that in every one. So it's good to have a couple versions of that for different, different kinds of activities. Um, That's true. Right. So. I don't know who else is on here. I see lots of names in black boxes. Yeah. Anybody else have a thought? Want to pop in? Well, feel free, you know, to contact Chris or I at any time. If, if you have questions, we're always happy to help or share our knowledge, so refer, refer you to resources that we've learned, things I've made many mistakes along the way. <laughs> we all did. And, and that's the, the beauty of it. We learn from them. And Absolutely. when we learn, we become stronger and say, yeah. We can. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing that's funny. I just, have, have any of you played around with chat GPT and done any of that? So, you know, we're having many, many conversations about chat GPT at our, at our institution and how all these um, AI assisted writing things are, are evolving. And so I asked chat GPT to write my bio just to see <laughs> what it would do <laughs> talk about your identity what what would what would ai say and um it, it was hilarious it was so wrong <clears throat> it said i got my degree at lsu and i just made made it up you know it was really kind of kind of funny but um i think over time a lot of those um things are going to be um all of our writing is going to be very ai assisted as it gets better and better so Maybe it'll help us write our NIH bio sketches too. I don't know, but uh, that's true. Funny. We cannot deny. We cannot deny that it's a tool that came to stay, and that we need to use it in our favor. And not that you're going to ban it. We, we're going to have to. It's just like the when we people use typewriters and moved to personal computers. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. You know, I used it a little bit for that. Re Chris and I are writing a review article together now. That's our our uh, mind the future contribution to right. Is this is this review uh -huh. article we're writing? And um, and I use Chat GPT a little bit to to help me see what information I missed. It was useful for that, you know. So um, I don't know. I'm I'm curious to see how it's gonna gonna be part of of all of this. So um, we'll see. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it have it write your bio. Just ask it to to write your bio. It, it will write I one. I will. I will. I will do it today. <laughs> then share I'm it with curious. me. Share it with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, yeah. you know, it's funny. This is homework. Little... So we can say that this is the homework for this break, uh, breakout room. Yes. <laughs> Go chat GPT and get to write and your bio. And start crafting your scientific identity you find in your <laughs> <laughs> It's really, really, it's really funny though, um, what it does. Because it wants to please you, right? So it's gonna write so it's gonna it's gonna write funny stuff. But I see. Hi, Rari Harim. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Harim. Hello. I have one question. Um, it's our scientific identity always vinculated to funding. For example, if, if 
something uh, Cindy asked, oh, what, what is your passion? Mm -hmm. So my question is, so if it's not funded, when is the time to give up or just to keep trying? That yes. would be my question. So, I, you know, that's a really complicated question too, because um, I, I told the last group, I used to keep a, a, a folder on my desk that was called various rejections. So I would just keep it, you know, because that's just part of life, right? And you just can't take it too personally and so forth. So, you know, if you really care about something and you're really passionate about accomplishing it and you need funding for it, um, you have to you have to ask why they didn't fund it, right? And you have to be critical with yourself. Um, it, you know. I see people who quit because they don't like criticism, right? <clears throat> and none of us thrives on criticism. I mean, it's not like you go out and you say, oh, can you send me 10 things wrong with me today? You know, you don't want that. But when you get comments back, it's really important to look at them and then look at them 10 days later, you know, when you're over being mad that all that work you did didn't get funded and ask what, what's the etiology of the problem? right here. And in terms of your identity, which is what we're talking about here, um, if, if, the, if, the, if your score for the science was, um, you know, okay, but the score about you, if there's comments about you, about whether you're the person to do that project, look at them and think what you need to do. As an example, I see critiques for the individual that come back from, you know, study section, for example, will say the institution has not invested, invested sufficiently in their career development. I see that very often, okay? And what that means is that the institution hasn't provided in individual space, hasn't provided sufficient startup funds, hasn't provided Minutes. tools for success, Over right? Oops. There's Rena. Gonna be here. You're going to be, um, you know, dinged for that. So I think that it's really important to have some folks that are seasoned grant folks to help you read those and interpret your critiques. Um, you know, if, if you want to ever send me some, I'm happy to look at them. I will be, you know, do that. Um, and you got to read between the lines and you got to be willing to fix them, right? Um, and if sometimes that involves changing the direction or changing the focus a little bit, um, you know, I had one grant that I, I had to send in literally five times to get it funded, um, but I didn't send the same grant five times. I kept, I sent it through the regular round and got so close. I think I got to like 18th percentile funding and it didn't get funded, right? Because you had to have 13th percentile. So turned it inside out, focus it from another direction and got it funded on the second time I submitted it there because I really believed in that project, right? Um, and got it funded on the second go. Cindy, can I add a little pearl of wisdom? Um, hey, Rena. Yes, I'm here. My video is not working for some reason, but but also contacting the program officer. We have Lillian Shum here who directs extramural yes. research, and they really are your advocates. They're the ones who, who, no matter what, want to see you succeed, you know, which is not necessarily what every reviewer is thinking about, right? They're thinking about finding the flaws in anything you've done. So I think contacting your program officer, um, Harim, is important. Uh, also, say if you come across, if you are impassioned about a new idea that is not reflected in NIDCR's portfolio. But it is doable. You can have something like I want to assess um, the effect of gravity on periodontal disease. It sounds like a great thing, but who's going up in a spaceship to evaluate that? Well, actually, people do. But but you, I'm trying to think of something that's kind of totally difficult to achieve, something that's realistic and is smart. You could write that up and actually send it to Dr. Shum as an idea. And every idea is considered seriously. You know, um, it could be something in your community that you've sensed or something at the bench that you feel needs a further investigation. So, so remember that we're open to all of those thoughts and ideas so that you create the area that you're passionate about if it in fact will fill up a gap in knowledge. 
for us. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, work to make yourself the person that they want to see do that. You know, that's what, what we, exactly. we keep talking about here. Make sure, you know, and, and, and Dr. D'Souza can comment on this very much so, but, and we, we talked about this earlier today, you know, once you're a person who has gone through and networked and, t- and been trained through all of these things that the NIDCR has worked so hard to put in place for trainees, they want to see you succeed. They don't want to see you fail. So do all the things, take all the advice you can get, program officers, senior folks, and, and you know, get funded because you, you responded to all those critiques and, and, you know, without getting defensive, just fine. Thank you. 